<laughs> okay, so, um, all right, so 2.4, this is the beginning of our graphing, uh, by hand graphing. So let me just lay out for you six basic functions. The way, the way this is going to work is you want to memorize, we're kind of moving into our game plan here, you know, the, uh, one of the main purposes of pre-calculus, one of our main goals is that you would become a more comfortable grapher, by hand grapher, by calculator also, but especially by hand as you move into Math 5A. Because if you can look at a function and know something in general about the graph, it's very helpful in a lot of situations just to have a, a feel of the picture. I mean, I don't mean exact in all the little details, but generally. So the, game, the way we achieve that, I really like the way this book does this, is um, memorize six basic ones. I'm really not into memory that much. I have a not a very good memory myself. So I give you a 3 by 5 card. You can just write them on your 3 by 5 card because I'm saying that for everything. But um, you memorize, write on the card, whatever you want, six basic ones. And then from there, we'll learn how they move. You move them up or down. You flip them right, left, and you do things with them. So you can, by the time we're done with memorizing the basic six and all the movements and flips and stuff, you'll know a lot about a lot of graphs. It's a good way to get that information. So let me give you the basics for stuff. I'm going to give you six to memorize or write in your 3 by 5 card if you have that much room. All right, you know that one. What's that equation? What's the equation of that? Y equals X squared, huh? All right, let me put right beside it the square root. Now, that means a 2 is in the hook, huh? Square root, remember square means 2? So when we say square, we mean two. So we call that a square root, we mean a two root. Anyway, what does a two root graph look like? Do you guys know that one? I'm trying to do these side by side. Second power, second root. What'd you call it? Did you call it a firework? No, oh, I mean, I'm imagining because I call it the firework. So I'm just imagining that you have my name too. I call it the firework because it looks like a little firework shooting off to me. It's the only one that has a stopping point. Like it just stops. It doesn't go left, in other words. It just sits right here. Oops, I'm not doing that. Whoops, I'm some weird, funny mode. All right, so um, it goes like that. So it kind of looks like a firework just because you put it on the ground there at the origin and it just shoots off to the right, at least unless it's flipped or something like that. Right, so that's the square root graph. That one only goes one way. He's the only graph that doesn't go both ways. So, all right, let's, go, let's come down and let's do um, x cubed. So we're getting our basic six here. What's x to the third power? Cube. What is that? Anybody know what that one looks like? It's like a, an arm yeah. I call it the snake, right? So it's snaky here. <coughs> it snakes up. All right. So now, right next to it, let's do third root. So notice I'm doing the third, you know, second power, second root, third power, third root. What does the uh, third root look like? It's the same thing except the snake goes sideways. Like that. Notice these are all centered at the origin. We're going to move them around later, or even, maybe even today. But you know, the basic ones, we put them centered at the origin. Okay, two more. Y equals, here, these are just two weird ones now, these last two. Absolute value of X. What's that? It's a V. It's a v. Yep. Instead of a U, it's a V. Straight lines. It goes both ways. It's always positive, right? It's always up. Absolute value. Last one, weirdest one, 1 over x. Anybody know what that one looks like? It's got two branches, like um, right here. Yeah, right. And it's got asymptotes. So right there and there, yeah, let me put in the asymptotes. You're exactly right. So the, um, the axes, until it's moved, are asymptote lines. So that's the only graph with asymptote lines, the 1 over x. He's got two. Notice he does not touch the middle, the origin. He cannot, because you plug in x equals 0 to him, he chokes, doesn't he? Denominator 0. So he's still centered at the origin, even though he doesn't touch the origin. Right? The middle of him is still the origin. And in fact, the way we're going to deal with him is I always say, look, it centers where the asymptote lines center, almost like crosshairs or something. You know, so that's, that's the center of the 1 over x graph. So there they are. There's the big six. So you can put those on your 3 by 5 card or memorize them or whatever. We're going to take those six, and then we're going to start, you know, moving them up, down, right, or left. We're going to flip them. We're going to do different things. We're going to stretch them. We're going to compress them. 
So it's all going to be based on those six. And then in weeks to come, we'll start adding to our basic six. By the time we're done, we'll get, well, like probably 12 all together. We'll add, you know, exponential and logarithmic graphs and some other things I can't remember right now. So um, we'll add to our basic six. But these are the basic six. You want to just know these cold. Just, you know, somebody wakes you up in the middle of the night, one over X, you know, two branches, ask them notes in the middle. You just want to know it cold because that will be helpful when you get to calculus because when you see kind of weird functions, you know, at least you go, okay, I know generally what that thing does, you know, and then you'll, you know, it's helpful in a lot of situations. All right, so use that. I, in fact, I had a student contact me six months ago saying that it helped her. She, think she was in calculus, just what she learned about graphs was, being, was helpful to her. All right, so there they are, the basic six. Um, wanted to say something else, but it'll come to me. Uh, what's their question here? So they're saying, hey, this one, what is it? Square. Yeah, square function. That's all they want in that one. So everybody got those copied down? I'll move on. Those are the basic six. That's what I want to say. Yeah, let me just say a little, a couple more words about, just to help you remember them. But first off, notice they all go kind of lower, like, well, not all, but almost all of them go lower left to upper right. Lower left to upper right. Even this one, left to lower left quadrant, upper right quadrant, lower left quadrant, upper right quadrant. Now, the, the, the exceptions, of course, are those, you know, the x squared's all up, and the Square, square root graph goes to the right and the absolute value is all up. So I guess those three are all up and these three are all lower left, upper right, lower left, upper right, lower left, upper right. At least before they're flipped, before they're moved, before they're stretched or compressed. So um, what else? Notice, okay, I notice that the power functions, meaning this one and this one, as opposed to the root functions, the power functions go up and down quickly because they're powerful. Whereas the roots mainly go sideways. They don't, because they're not, because roots don't grow fast. Don't, don't grow quickly, do they? Right? Rooting numbers, like what's the root of 100? It's only 10. Way out to 100. If I go, if I go way out over here to 100, the square root graph is only up at 10. Right? It just doesn't grow very fast. What if I go out to 100 on the x squared graph? How high is that? I'm waiting for that answer. 10,000, 100 squared. 100 times 100. 10,000. It's up at 10,000. Quite a difference in the growth pattern, right? So the power functions go up and down very fast, whereas the root functions mostly go sideways. I mean, it's still going up, but not very quickly. And this, this one is still going up and down, but not very quickly. The third power goes up and down much faster, right? Just general characteristics of these graphs and how they work. And um, the 1 over x, these are asymptote lines to the right, so it gets infinitesimally close to this asymptote, infinitesimally that to, close to that. And that's what an asymptote line is. It's a line of approach, a line you get infinitesimally close to. So same thing here. This branch gets really close here. This branch gets really close there. So I just wanted to point out some of those characteristics. All right. Because you know linear already. So I guess, I guess that's the seventh one. All right, so this, so this one's linear. Um, at f of x equals 3, that, 3x, three that's just y equals 3x, right? Remember, function values are just y. Function letters, I should say, are just y. So how do you graph that? How do you graph a linear equation? I would just put a plus 0 out here. Remember, it's mx plus b. Where do you start? Origin. Where? Origin. Origin. Because, because it's this, whatever number's out here, which is a 0, that's your starting dot, right? That's, your, that's on the center line. That's your y-intercept, right? And then, then what do you do with the three from this? So I got one dot. I just need one more. A line, you just need two dots. Wait. Yeah, it's a slope. Put it over one, right? Rise over run. Remember all that? So you go up one, two, three, over one, connect the dots. You got the straight line. You know all that already, right, from your algebra days. So that's all you got to do with that one. So I don't know. Which one is that? Is it D? Yeah, yeah it looks like D. So that'll be easy for you. It's not multiple choice on the exam. Right? Take a look. Practice exams are out there. The graphs will not be multiple choice. Okay, so y equals, where should I here? I'll put it over here for us. y equals minus 5x cubed. Okay, so let's get into the thinking. You guys ready? I hope you take this down. This is, this is the valuable part. This is heavily tested. You know, this is where, this is what... I'm mainly interested in you. It's probably the most important thing in this next exam. How do you basically 
figure out, it's not, it's not going to be multiple choice on the exam. That's the unfortunate thing about math Excel. It can, it's not the best. Graphs, you know, they can't have you graph it yourself and put that in, so they do multiple choice. So it's a little unfortunate. It's not the best practice. Make sure you can really do it without multiple choice for the exam. Okay, um, with that said, first off, when you look at X cubed, you should think, basically it's a snake, right? It's basically the snake graph. You know, you have that in your 3x5 card, probably, or in your memory banks. So you go, okay, it's some kind of a snake graph, but what is that 5 going to do to it? And what is that negative going to do to it? Yeah. Let me do this for you. I'll tell you the rules as far as what numbers and negatives do with flipping graphs and stretching and compressing them and moving them and stuff like that. But the rules are hard to follow perfectly. So I'm going to give you the rules, and I'm going to say these are the rules, but it's pretty hard to follow that perfectly every time because a couple of the rules can do opposite things depending on the order in which you do them, and it's pretty tricky to know the order. I mean, I'll say it, but you'll see it's kind of tricky. So I'm going to tell you the rules, and then I'll say, but practically, the best way to get your answer is to do this, where you kind of partly make a table and partly use the rules. So I want, to, I want you to hear the big picture as we dive in. I'm going to tell you the rules, but don't try to just rely upon the rules. They can really trick you at a couple of points. I'll, I'll tell you the rules, but they get pretty subtle. So I'll say, yeah, those are the rules, but use a table and the rules. That's the best way. So that's my game plan. So let me show you. So, so you look at that, and, and I'll tell you the rules. Basically, do I tell you all the rules now? Um, okay. What that, negative, um, what that negative 5 does, okay, numbers multiplied. Numbers multiplied have a stretch or compression effect, not a movement. Um, oh, but before I say that, I've got I to explain to you x... x effects and y effects. This is going to have a vertical, a vertical effect is what it's going to do, not a horizontal effect. How do you know? Because it's not in there with x. Okay, let me say that again. This would be in there with x. That's, that, would be, that would be an x effector, I call it. That would have a, that negative 5, whatever negative 5 does, would do it sideways. This negative 5 will do it vertical. This one is a vertical effector, meaning y effector. Do you see, you see in the difference? So, and that, that goes for anything, any effector. So the first thing you've got to distinguish, when you see a negative 5, you've got to say, okay, is, that, is that a vertical y kind of negative 5, or is that a sideways x kind of negative 5? Well, this one is a vertical. I mean, well, it's not by Y. It's, it's ne they're never going to be by Y. is always going to be alone. What the issue is, is it did it get into X's little world? See, this would be getting into X's little world, right? Because this one right here, that one's in X's little world. What's X's little world? Being cubed. So if it's in the being cubed, or if you had an absolute value function, if it's inside the absolute value, or if we were doing square root, if it was in the square root, if it's in there with X in his little world, then it's an X thing. It's going to have a sideways X effect. But if it's out, like this is out. He's like, I'm not being cubed. I'm not in X's little world. I'm not walking in X's shoes, to use the analogy, right? So he's a Y. He's like, I'm not an X. I'm a Y. So that's the first thing you've got you to know. Okay, so you look at that negative five. Okay, that's a Y. It's going to have some kind of a vertical effect, not horizontal. Okay, now, what does a negative five multiplied do. Negative 5 multiplied. Numbers multiplied. Um, stretch. So that's going to stretch, meaning it's going to go up and down five times as fast. It's going to grab the normal snake and it's going to pull it up and down five times as fast. That's what that's going to do. Now what about the negative? That's going to flip it vertically. So those are the two things that are going on. So the, a negative multiplied number flips. It's going to flip the graph. So in other words, the general idea is we're going to have this snaky thing, and instead of going, like here, I'll just draw the original one, instead of going like this, that's the, that's the normal snake, it's going to flip it instead, right? It's going to be a flipped snake, and it's, so it's going to go like this, and it's going to go up and down five times faster than the normal snake. So that's generally what we're expecting. You with me? 
We're generally expecting, see, see what I did? See how I grabbed that thing and I flipped it, right? That's because the negative multiplier and the five, you know, it'll, it'll flip it and pull it five times as fast up and down. So that's the rules. Now, having said all that, the rules are kind of tricky. It's easy to accidentally mess up the rules. My strong suggestion, the best way by far to do this, is to make a table. That'll help you. And, and I don't mean like a bunch of points or anything. I'm talking about a really simple table, which is two points. That's all you need. If you have the general knowledge of the rules and just two points, you're solid and good to go. I have a particular two points in mind. What they are is the center point, first off. You want to find the middle. Now, the, the normal U-shape, not U-shape, snake, is right in the middle, right? Now, this one, the, this one won't move, but some of them do move. Some of them do move. Just because this negative 5 is not a move. Well, well, how, how would you move? Why, why is that negative 5? It doesn't move the graph. It stretches the graph. How would a negative 5 move a graph? Do you know? If it was x cubed minus 5 like that. That would slide the graph down 5. See the difference? That would take the whole snake and move him down 5 rather than stretching him, which is what this does. This stretches it 5. It doesn't move it anywhere. It stays right where it's at centered at the origin, but just pulls on it, top and bottom, stretches it. So anyway, we'll get to that. Um, anyway, so what I'm saying is find the center first off. Now, how do you find the center? The center will, for these six and the other ones we learned throughout the course, will always be what makes the X zone zero. So let me write a little note here. Make the X zone zero become zero. Now, that's just zero in our case. Let me give you a case where it wouldn't be just zero, because I think it's like confusing. When, like, isn't that just always zero? What are you talking about? Well, like if they gave me um, x minus 3 cubed or something. Or let me just make it 2. X, what, if, what if they gave me x minus 2 cubed? Or let's, let's go x plus 2. x plus 2, okay. What if the function had been x plus 2 cubed? What then would I plug in for x to make his zone, his little world, 0? Negative 2. And that would be what I would put here for the center. I would put negative 2 for the x, and I'd plug it in and find the y. Is that making sense? The center will always be whichever x value makes his little zone 0. Just his zone. And like if there was something else out here like plus 7 or something, I don't care about that. This is his zone. That's the x's little world, right? Are you tracking with me? So the first x value I'm going to plug in to find the center, to find the middle of whatever the graph is, the middle will always be located at the x value that makes the x zone become 0. Make x zone become 0. In our case, it's just simply a 0, right? Because we don't have anything that fancy right now. So we just simply say, oh, okay, no big deal. Plug in 0. Plug in 0 right here. What are we going to get? Let me go back over here and work it out on the graph. So coming back over here, I go, okay, y is negative 5, 0 cubed, y is 0. So 0, 0, no big deal. Didn't go anywhere. The center is still 0, 0, right? Okay, so you get the center, which is nothing new in our case, and then one other point, just one other point. And it's super easy to do. Just add 1. That's almost always, and I'll tell you the exception in a little while, going to work. That's almost always the best thing to do. Just simply add 1 to whatever that original center. So if that original center was negative 2, got my first point, then I would add 1 and plug in negative 1. Whatever this first center is, which is zeros off the x zone, then add 1. Plug in 1. So now just plug in 1 to uh, the function. Minus 5x cubed. Plug in 1. What's that going to be? The class answer together in unison. The answer is? Negative 5. Good. So there's my two points. And that's, that's the best way. Have, have in your mind the general rules of the flip and all that stuff. But, but two points is really nice, especially when you know one of them is the middle. Right? So let's, let's do the graph. Now, here's what we're expecting. Let's actually graph those two dots and see that what we're expecting is, in fact, the truth. So what, 0, 0? Got that one. What's the other one? Over 1, down 5. 4, 5, right there. Over 1, down 5. So there's the graph. Sure enough, just like we thought. It had been flipped, and it's going down fast. Because normally the graph's over 1, down 1. It's way down 5, 5 times as fast. 
There is. That's all I'm going to ask. So on the exam, you'll see on the practice exam, on the actual exam, there'll probably be like three or four of these. I think these are very important. And I'll ask you to show me the center point and one other point <coughs> and the picture. No multiple choice. I'll say, show me the center, one other point, and the, and the picture. You got it. Is that good? Questions on that one? So I don't even know what multiple choice answer that is. Oh, it's A. Over one down five. It's A, huh? Good there. Questions I can answer? Um, okay. So there we go. So they want us to graph seven hours. Okay, so I'm just going to keep it pretty casual because they're, they're not getting serious yet. It'll be the next section, I guess, 2-5, where they get more serious about all that. But we got it now. So how are you going to graph that? As soon as you look at that, which basic graph is it? It's like the 1 over x, huh? Except it's got a 7 in there. So it's, it's like the two branches, right? It's like either this one or this one, huh? It's not C, right? It's the two branches. Okay. So, um, yeah, this one's tricky. Yeah, I'll just say it quick. I'll say it slower tomorrow, and we'll go over it in more detail. What, what did I just tell you to do? I said, look, you, you, you find the center point. First off, I don't have room there. You find the center point, and then one other point, right? So find the center point. Okay. How do I find the center point? What's the rule I gave you? Plug in whatever will make the X zone zero. Well, that's a problem on this one, isn't it? Here's the X zone. X is a little world. It's right there. Right? It's where X lives and breathes. Right there. So plug in what will make that zero. Well, that's a zero again. And what does that do when you plug in zero there? It chokes. Right? You get Y equals 7 over 0. You can't have a zero in the bottom of a fraction. That's undefined. It's like, no, I don't go there. Right. It doesn't go there. You know what that means when it doesn't go there? That means that's the center of the asymptotes. Remember, that's what an asymptote... Oh, well, I shouldn't say remember. We haven't covered yet. But a vertical asymptote you can't touch. You might already know. You can't touch a vertical asymptote. That's telling you not, not where a dot on the graph is, because it's not a dot, but it's telling you where the vertical asymptotes. In fact, not just the vertical. It's telling you where the two asymptotes cross, the crosshairs. I guess I'm a violent math teacher. It's, 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 a, it's a gun thing. So it's telling you where the crosshairs go. So that's what I want to let you know. Now, what do you mean it's telling you where? It says undefined, right? Pretend undefined is zero. Did your math teacher just say that? Don't tell the dean I teach this way. <laughs> Pretend it's really zero. It's not. It's undefined. But when you get that undefined thing, I've noticed a trick just to help out. It'll work really nicely if you just pretend that undefined is zero because that will be exactly where the crosshairs go. So let me do that. So boom, there's the axis system. I'm going to put on, that means at 0, 0 right here is where the two asymptote lines cross. We'll see it later tomorrow or the next day. It works really nicely. Even when they've moved the asymptote somewhere funny, it works beautifully to find that center of the asymptotes. All right. So we'll go, we need one other point. What do we do? We add 1, plug in 1. What do you get? y equals 7 over 1, 7. Over 1, up 7. Over 1, up 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Right there. What does that mean? That means there's a branch here and there's a branch here. So it's, it's B, isn't it? See, see how they have the over 1, up 7? There it is. All right, enough said for today. They're not going to get serious about this, so tomorrow I'll be much more slow and careful about the tables and the movements. I, I was kind of jumping again. Okay, so, okay, so cube root, so it's y equals the cube root of this. So as soon as you see cube root, you're thinking, okay, it's some kind of snake, right? Let's make our xy table. You get the center. How do you get the center? Whatever will zero out that little world. X's world, where he lives and breathes, right there. The x zone, well, it's just zero again. We haven't had anything but zero for these. They really are different. We'll see tomorrow. Uh, so that's just zero. This is this the cube root of three times zero then, which is just zero. Whoops, that's not what I meant to do. So that's just uh, the cube root of zero, which is just zero. So the center again is zero, zero. Plug in one. What are you going to get for one? Y equals the cube root of one. That's just one, huh? Cube root, cube root asks what times itself three times is one? Well, one. 
times itself three times. Oh, I just I forgot the three. What am I doing? Whenever I look around the room and like the majority of you are frowning, I know I'm wrong. So yes, cube root of three, right? Cube root of three. What is that? You guys got a calculator? I have no idea. What's cube root of three? It's like one point, maybe two, one or two, one point one, one point two. That big? Okay. 1.4. 1.4. So just, just estimate it. That's all I care about in the exam is just eyeball it. Over 1, if this is 1, this is 2. It's, you know, about right there. So over 1, up 1.4. Like that. Okay. Now what does that mean? What, what's the general? All you need, you guys tracking with my game plan here? All you need is two dots, the center dot and one other dot, if you know the general look of the shape. It's the snake. So it's, so it's got to do this, doesn't it? If it's a snake and this is the center and this is one other dot, that's what it must look like. See how we're putting those two pieces of information together? That it's a snake and the two dots. Oh, this is a cube root. Oh, man, I'm having a bad day. All right, let's try it again. Just kidding. I was testing you. Well done. All right. It's, it's this, huh? And mine should have gone further down probably. But whatever, good enough. Yeah, it's a sideways snake, thank you. Because it's cube root, not third power. Right. Are you good there? Now, um, yeah, enough said for it. I'll talk about more tomorrow. We better move on. We got to eat those peace. Yeah, okay, so piecewise function. Yeah, these, I know these are hard for students, so I wish I had a little more time on this one. Yeah, we might, we might end up taking two, a day and a half on this, I think. Probably. All right, that's a piecewise function. There's a whole bunch of these. Um, definitely be one of these on the exam we take next uh, Wednesday, Thursday. Piecewise function means that the function is given to you in pieces. It means exactly that, piecewise. So in other words, when x is less than 0, you're supposed to plug into that. When x is right on 0, you're supposed to do that. When x is greater than 0, you're supposed to plug into that. That's what it's saying. It's giving you instructions for when you plug into x squared, or when you say the answer is just 1, or when you plug into 3x plus 3, depending on what the x value is you're plugging in. So let's do the first one. f of negative 1. So what's the x? Negative 1. Remember, what's in the parentheses is the x. So when x is negative 1, which of these three... Am I going to plug into x squared? Am I just going to say the answer is 1? Or am I going to plug into 3x plus 3? Yeah, you go over here and you say, well, x is negative 1. x is less than 0. So that means use the x squared. So you use different functions for different x values with a piecewise function, right? So plug into the x squared. And so that's positive 1. Let's do part B. Part B says f of 0. So when x is 0, when x is 0, I just say the answer is 1. There's not even an x here, right? There's not even an x there. You just say it's 1. Nowhere to put the x. Okay, finally, part C, f of, um, was it 2? So when x is 2, x is greater than 0. You plug into 3x plus 3. So you plug in the, oh, not 0, 2, huh? The x is 2. Plug in the 2. What's that? 6 and 9. And that's the answer to that one. And there it is. We good with that? We're going to graph them in a minute. That's like a warm-up for graphing. Let's do number 12. Okay, so... Um, all right, they want... Basically, you know, they're saying all these questions. It all comes down to the graph. Basically, if you can graph this thing, you can answer all those questions super easy. So it's all about graphing. And that's what I'll ask you to do on the exam. You can see it's already on the practice exam. The exam next week, there'll be one question where I give you a piecewise, and I'm just going to say graph it. Just graph it for me. So I'll just I'll put an axis, a big old axis, right there on the paper for you. And I'll, or maybe I won't. I can't remember. Look at the practice exam. And I'll just say, give me a graph. So, how do you do this? Basically, the graph is going to be in two pieces. Do you see where the pieces divide? It's all about x being 1. This is the x-axis, right? It's all about 1. In fact, let me just put a wall here. It's, now, it's not really an asymptote line. It's just, it's just I'm going to erase it later. 
It's just there for me mentally to keep remembering what's going on. You don't have to put that in. But I'm just reminding myself, okay, there's like a wall. There's two x values we're talking about here. At x equals 1, everything changes. In, in, in this side of the wall, we're talking about when x is less than 1, we're talking about this function, minus x plus 3 y equals minus x plus 3, f of x, which is y. Over here to the right of the wall, where x is greater than or equal to 1, we're talking about y equals 3x minus 1, aren't we? So it's like we graph two graphs and kind of connect them in the middle, or maybe they don't connect up. They don't have to connect. But they have to both go to the middle to stop. That's the deal. So basically, that's, that's, there it is. I mean, it's, you're, you're simply doing two graphs, and they both go to that middle line, the line x equals 1. So let's do it. Let's, uh, let's, we could start with the other one. doesn't matter. I'll just start with this, this side. Okay, so I'm going to make an xy table for this side. Now, when I make my xy table for that side, I'm going to particularly plug in x values on this side, like how about 1 and 0. Now, you might say, yeah, but 1's right there on the line. Yeah, but I need to know what it does right on the line. And you might say, yeah, Mr. M, but it's, but it's just less than 1. The other one has the equals. Right, I know. But I need to know what it does infinitely close to 1 from the left, even though it doesn't hit the 1. You can't just do 0 and call it good. Right, because it gets it, because it gets to point nine 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 nine. It gets infinitesimally close to one, even though it's only for stuff less than one. That makes sense. So I put a one and I circle it. That's my little way of reminding myself. It doesn't really hit the one. It gets infinitesimally close. There'll be an open dot there, but I still need to go there. I'm not just going to do zero. Right? You see what I'm saying? You've got to still do 1. That's a common mistake I see students make. They go, oh, no, no, it's less than 1, so I, I can't do 1. I can just do 0. Well, they're thinking too whole number-ish. There's a whole bunch of numbers between 0 and 1. Right? It gets infinitesimally close to 1. Point nine 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 nine. You need to get close to 1. You need to basically do 1. All right? So plug in 1 to what function? Negative x plus 3. Because that's the function you're supposed to use for values of x less than 1, huh? So plug in 1, what do you get? Negative 1 plus 3, what is that, 2? Circle that, though. So over 1 up to, right there is an open dot. Because it doesn't really hit 1, but it gets infinitesimally close to that. So that makes sense? Now, what's another point I should do? How about x is 0? I'm not gonna, why am I not going to do x is 2? Because 2 is over here. And that's a different function, which I'll do in a minute. But right now, I'm doing this function. I'm doing the left side. So I'm only going to plug in values x equals 1 and left of that. Right? Because according to the original definition up there, go back to the original definition, right? You, you, when you're doing any x is less than 1, you use this function. All right, so don't do 2. Do like 0. You don't have to do 0. You can do negative 1, negative 7, whatever you want. You know, anything less than 1. I'm just going to do 0. Plug into that function. Negative 0 plus 3, such as 3. So over 0, up 3. 2, 3. Solid dot. Good so far. So I got two dots in the left graph. Is that enough to graph it? Absolutely. What kind of a graph is this thing? What kind of function is that? It's a line. It's linear. X is just first power. Remember when X is just first power, it's a straight line. So if you have two dots, you know what it does. Boom. There's the graph on that side. It's that straight line shooting that way. Tim. So when we're graphing it on the test, do you want us to put the uh, open dot on the, on the wall? Yeah. Open dot. It's got to be an open dot there. Because okay. it doesn't hit that wall. It just gets infinitesimally close. Now let's do the right side. So on the right side, I'm going to also make an XY table. Maybe I should do it down here. I don't know. Where it's even going to hit. Where is it going to hit? Uh, well, be fine. Okay. X, Y table over here for the right side. But now on the right side, is that on the screen? Kind of. It gets off the screen in a hurry on this left projector. You can look over there. It's better on the screen over there, isn't it? All right. Anyway, um, so I'm using the function 3X minus 1 over here because um, 
That's the function you're supposed to use when x is greater than or equal to 1. You're supposed to plug into 3x minus 1. So I'm going to plug in like 1, because I've got to do the wall, and 2. 1 and 2 for my x values. And I'm, and I'm going to count the 1, because it's greater than or equal. Right? So the 1 is a solid dot. You guys tracking with me? I'm, I'm supposed to do this is for x is greater than or equal to 1. So I do include the 1. I'm not going to circle it. It's a solid dot. Plug in 1. What do you get? 3 times 1 minus 1. What's that? A 2. 2. So over 1, up 2. Look at that. It's right there. Whoops. So the solid dot fills in the hollow dot. Now that does not always happen. That does not always happen. Sometimes there's like a solid dot up here. And that other one just stays hollow. They don't have to meet up. They often don't. They usually don't. They're just making this one happen to meet up. Is that making sense? What's happening there? So this, this case, the solid dot fills in the hollow dot. Over 1 up 2. Plug in 2. 3 times 2 is what? 6 minus 1, 5. Over 2 up 5. 3, 4, 5. Over 2 up 5. Right up here. And, and this one also is a straight line, isn't it? 3x minus 1. That's a straight line, so there we go. It's like, almost like a V shape, but the two slopes aren't the same. And they connect in the middle totally solid because the solid dot filled in the hollow dot. But again, that won't always happen. That won't even usually happen. Question. Is there a way you can combine two uh, graph equations to make one? No, they're, they're, they're separate. They're, they're in separate zones. So they don't combine. Yeah, they, they, never, they never get together. Uh, no, that would make it um, discontinuous because then that solid dot would be down here and that would be a jump discontinuous. <laughs> Other questions on that one? Is that good? Does that make sense? So basically you're just doing two graphs in two different zones. The main thing is you've got to keep straight what X is you're plugging. The people that get confused on this aren't paying close attention to the Xs. That's what I've seen over the years. They get confused with the X. So you've got to pay close attention to, you know, you've got so the original function, the uh, 3X minus 1 up here. Well, let's start with the top one. So this function can only be plugged into with x is lower than 1, right? And the bottom function can only be plugged into with x is greater than or equal to 1. As long as you follow that, you'll be good. That's the, that's the key. All right, let's try. Okay, why don't you try that one? Let me give you a minute. Try that one. Start working on the graph there. I'm going to run through roll. I'll give you guys a chance to do that one. 